the next great thing is going to be something completely new. It's going to be innovation that's, that's fresh and completely clean. So if there's no formula for that, what can I tell you? That still would be useful since there's no formula for making that next big break. Well, I want to try and share with you what I've looked at over the years, looking back at our companies and other companies, what ends up mattering most. So I took a look at some of the standard elements that people talk about leading to success. The idea, the team, the business model, the funding, the timing. In fact, I always used to think the idea mattered the most. Uh, and I took a look at these, and I'll look at these in more detail. So these five areas, idea, team, business model, funding, and timing. Let me talk about each of them. So first on the idea. There's the novelty and differentiation of the idea. It's how new is it, how much of it has not been done before. How much truth is there in the idea that no one else has seen before? And let me give you an example of what I mean by a truth. Let's, say, let's take Airbnb as an example of a company with an interesting new truth. Their truth was people would be willing to rent out a room of their house or their whole house to a complete stranger. Now, when that truth was first talked about with others, most people laughed at that. In fact, notably, I think Fred Wilson, a great VC here in New York, passed on that idea because that was just too outrageous. But in fact, it did turn out to be true. So moving the idea from being outrageous to actually proving that it was true, a huge amount of value was created. Well, I think that's an example of an idea truth. Now, that idea also had been tried before, but wasn't tried exactly the way they tried it. Another example of, of uh, idea com com is competitive differentiation or competitive moats. Are there things you can build around your idea to protect other people from copying it? OK, now to team and execution. And I'm going to tell you how I score all of these in a moment, but I'm just summarizing them first. When I look back at our companies, I often see some teams that were really, really effective. We once had a McKinsey CEO, an uh, ex-McKinsey per person who was a CEO of one of our companies, and he was just very, very effective. He just really got things done. He plowed through barriers. Uh, also, adaptability was another factor we saw in various of our teams. How much did they listen to new information? How much did they change in the light of new customer data? On the business model, some of our companies had a very clear path to profitability, very clear path to revenues. Some of them didn't. On the funding, some of our companies were able to raise a lot of money, and some of them weren't. And on timing, some companies we had were way too early, some companies were early, and some companies were too late. So I tried to assess all of these things. And what I did is I looked at 200 companies. I looked at 100 of ours and 100 of other people companies. And I took a look at 10 outliers in each set. 10 companies of ours, five that turned out to be wild successes, worth more than a billion dollars, and five that we thought were going to be worth more than a billion dollars but failed. And then the same thing for 100 other companies. We looked at 10, that, 10 companies in particular, five that turned out to be wild successes that people didn't think were going to be wild successes, and five that turned out to be failures but people thought were going to be wild successes. And I came to this conclusion. Here's looking across these, these 10 companies from Idealab and looking across these 10 companies from outside of Idealab. I'll come back to this in a moment. And here was the summary. Timing actually mattered the most. I was completely shocked to discover this. This is completely subjective. It's my own, my own look at companies and my own evaluation. But let me at least tell you why I came to this conclusion. Timing mattered the most. Team and execution mattered second. The idea was actually third. The thing that I used to think was the most important thing. I mean, heck, I named it Idealab because I thought it was all about ideas. I thought the idea was everything. And in fact, it wasn't the most important thing. Business model was, was uh, uh, fourth. And funding was the least of the top five. Uh, and now let me try and uh, explain these. So funding mattered the least, I think, because if you have a good idea, as long as you have enough money to get it out there, and if you find product market fit and find traction, you will find a way to get more money and get there, or you'll find a way to last if you have adaptability. So funding was the least important variable. It's also, in these times today, by the way, 2014 compared to 1995, 1996, or the other companies I started, when I raised money for Knowledge Venture in 1991, it was very hard to raise money. Today, funding is, is very, very easy to come by. There is so much money out there between angel investors and other investors. If you have an idea, funding is not the problem. To at least give your idea a try. It might be hard to get funding to scale, but that's probably if you're not achieving product market fit. Business model. The reason why business model came in second to last is because if you have traction, you can adapt a business model. You can add on a business model. Take Twitter as an example, or even Facebook. Facebook early on, people laughed at it because they thought there's no way there's going to be a business model. It's making billions of dollars of revenue now because it's got trillions of page views and so much valuable insights on, on its users. So business model can be added afterwards. You don't have to have a business model at first. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't help to have one. It's not saying that you shouldn't have some of that thought in mind, but it, I just think it's much, much lower important. Next comes the idea. If you can still come up with an idea that really resonates with customers, and in fact, if you don't, you won't succeed, but it's not the single most important thing. 
uh, I think it's very valuable to try and look for things that are, you're very passionate about. And I'll talk more about that later because I think that's necessary for su success as well. But I don't think it's a, the most important thing. The idea alone won't get you there. And in particular, when I look back at our own companies and other, other companies, sometimes the idea had been tried before and didn't work, but then it was tried again and it worked. And I was trying to figure out, was it timing or execution? And that's why I concluded timing actually mattered more. Execution matters so much more than even the idea because, and this is, a, it's kind of funny that I would even be quoting Mike Tyson in an article on, <laughs> to talk about innovation, but Mike Tyson had a great line about, um, uh, about fighting, which I think actually applies to this, which is um, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it is like that in business. You have this whole plan. In fact, I remember when I used to start companies, everything was about writing the perfect business plan and coming up with a business plan and having all the details and planning out five years and all that. And I learned what a joke that was because basically the, your first interaction cu with customers is like getting punched in the face. The customer straightens out everything and changes all your plans because they have their own ideas. You've got your idea, but they have their ideas about how to use your product or what they want. And that's why I think the team and execution adaptability matters so much because when you first get punched, you have to re recoil from that punch and respond to it and listen to it and, and pay attention to it and then adjust your business after it. And that's why I think that, that's the aspect of the team that I think matters so much. But now timing. Why did I put timing first? Well, so many ideas need to be executed in their right time. I look back at companies that we had that they failed, and they almost always, except for team and execution, they failed because we tried them way too early. The world wasn't ready for them yet. Um, or we were too late, meaning there were too many competitors already. So timing is, is a little bit of luck, but it's not only luck. You can actually look at the market and see if the world is ready for what you're making. And let me try and give you some advice on how to evaluate that and use that as a judgment factor in making decisions on a company. In fact, I'll go to the Airbnb example first, and I'll give some of my own examples too. The Airbnb example, many companies had made places where you could rent other people's homes before. Airbnb, the, the guys also made this product out of need. I don't know if you know the story about the Airbnb founders, but they were in San Francisco. They were from Rhode Island School of Design. They were, there was a conference in town, a design conference. The city was sold out, and they decided to make some, they were broke. They uh, made some extra money just by inflating an air mattress in their apartment and renting it out to people who couldn't get rooms who were coming in town from, I think, Rhode Island for the conference. And um, why, that it was very clever. It was, it was born out of immediate need. But the timing was incredible because it was just as the huge recession was hitting. So this idea, which might have been tried many times but didn't work, the timing was incredible because people needed extra money very badly. So people were actually willing to rent out their homes in a way they might not have been just a few years earlier or even maybe four years later. So timing was actually a big factor in that company's success, not only the idea. And I look back on one of our companies. We started a company called Z.com uh, in 1999. It was, we saw all the companies that were happening on the internet and we thought, well, right here, we were right in Los Angeles, so we're right in Hollywood. Um, we thought entertainment was going to move online. In fact, video form entertainment. So we started a company, we put in $250,000 called Z.com. We raised a million dollars and built an entertainment team to try and make uh, short form online video entertainment content. It was maybe a forerunner to YouTube. And then we even raised $10 million, built up a team of 100 people, and started signing comedians to exclusive contracts. In fact, I, I came to New York, and I actually remember this was a hysterical meeting, me sitting in a room with Chris Rock, trying to close him on being an exclusive provider of content to this little website, z.com. He barely knew what the internet was. And I closed him. I gave him 5% equity and a million dollars for a five-year exclusive to everything Chris Rock did online. Uh, I signed Adam Sandler in a trailer at Descanso Gardens when he was filming a movie. Uh, we signed a whole bunch of great people. We signed four of our $10 million for exclusive content. We started making this content. People were downloading it and loved it. But there was only about 10% broadband penetration in 2000. To watch a video online, you had to do all this kludgy stuff to download codecs and plug in these weird things to watch video. So we had this great stuff that nobody could watch. We, we eventually were losing money. And in 2002, we reduced the company down to 45 people. In 2003, we reduced the company down to 11 people. Then at the end of 2003, we went out of business. And in 2004, Adobe comes out with their Flash plug-in video player. And the flip cam comes out, and everybody starts making a whole bunch of videos with their USB stick. And then two guys come and say, hey, we should make a website where people can share videos since now they're easy to view. Broadband penetration had reached 40%, and then YouTube was born. I'm not saying that the YouTube guys didn't execute brilliantly. 
They got Sequoia's investors and raised a lot of money. They did a great, great job. But timing was incredible. We really blew that company by not sticking around until the timing was right. And we should have looked at the signals. We should have looked at the slow broadband penetration rate, slow growth, and, and survived until the elbow occurred in the, in the ramp of, of that curve. So we could have looked more smartly at what the other signals were telling us. People love what we were making, but they just couldn't watch it. And sometimes you can't control all the external variables in the new thing you're making. And you have to be very honest with yourself about what the rest of the world is telling you on, on the timing front. So that timing thing came, on, came up over and over again with the companies I looked at. And even Facebook's timing was incredible. Friendster was out before Sp Facebook. Sp MySpace was out before Facebook. Now, Facebook had incredible execution. I actually scored Facebook extremely high in execution because Mark Zuckerberg's incredible. And they brought in Sheryl Sandberg. But even that was later. But their execution strategy of rolling out college by college and, and so many things they did were beautiful. Execution, but their time was really, really perfect, as was some of other companies as well. So I do think that the reason why timing is actually somewhat liberating as a competitive advantage is that is where a small entrepreneur can actually out execute a big company. A big company is often lazy and lubbering and has inertia, and that's where an individual can time something beautifully. Obviously, they can also have a brand new idea, where the idea is very powerful too, and they can be more adaptable. But the top three things, what's great about the top three things is those are the exact things that a small startup can beat a big company at. Big company has money and brand and existing customers and all that, so they have better funding. They probably already have a business model. It's the top three things that the big company is often hesitant to, to uh, obviously, the innovator's dilemma, interrupt their own revenue stream, but also really listen to the market as well as a small company can. So that's actually what's liberating about starting a company against a big competitor.